Welcome, dear friends, to another episode in the podcast series, The Way Out Is In. I am Joe Confino, working at the intersection of personal transformation and systems change. And I am Brother Fab Hu, a Zen Buddhist monk in the tradition of Plum Village, student of Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh. And today we are going to talk about the very modern disease of busyness, overwhelm and burnout and how Thich Nhat Hanh's teachings can help us come back into balance. The way out is in. Hello, dear friends. Uh, I'm Joe Confino. And I am Brother Fab Hu. And Brother, we've been uh, away for a short while because we talk about busyness and you've been rather busy. So do you want to just... Why have we, why have we not been recording every week? Hello, everyone. Yes, we have been absent for a very good reason. Reopen to receive hundreds of people for retreats. So starting in May, reopening Plum Village, having guests um, for two weeks. And then came our big celebration of 40 years of Plum Village. We hosted a two-week retreat, um, which hosted 730 people uh, across the three hamlets in Plum Village, France. Then it led to a science retreat, and then a climate activist retreat, and then most recently, a wake-up retreat for young practitioners from the age of 18 to 35 with 550 young practitioners. That was quite amazing. And actually, right now, as we are recording, we are in the midst of the first week of our summer opening. After two years, Plum Village is finally having children program as well as teen program back in the monastery. So, brother... Um a lot of people might imagine that the monastics just sit here and meditate and um, and uh, look for insights into the deeper meaning of life, but actually you're just as busy as everybody else. That's right. But our busyness also has elements of practice, has element of joy, has element of play, has element of study because we learn from these retreats. We learn from all of this engagement um, when we welcome people into the, into our monastery, into our retreat, because it's a deep dive inward for not just the practitioners that come from outside, but also for all of the monastics. So brother, that, that's really interesting because those elements, I think, let us come back to those because you talked about play, joy, study, um, practice. Practice. So, so let, let's, let's sort of interweave those elements into what we discussed, because what I've been experienced, brother, not, not that it's new, but I would say pretty much every conversation I've been having with people recently has been about people feeling overwhelmed. And, and of course, we know this is not new, but, but it's, just the, it's just everybody I talk to is feeling that they've got too much to do, they've got too little time, that they're dealing with issues that are almost existential by nature and that um, they feel guilty because they feel that actually they need to be, the weight is on their shoulders, they're responsible for saving the world or saving this or saving that and find it very, very difficult to stop, to actually come back to themselves. And, and people are, as we know, burning out. So I think it'd be really good to devote this episode to really looking at this in detail because what I find very difficult when I'm speaking to people is that you can't just say, oh, well, don't do what you're doing. Right. Because actually people are, have got their jobs, they've got the responsibilities, they've got families, they've got a multitude of things. They, you can't just say, I'm not going to do any of these things and I'm going to curl up in a ball and go to bed and put the duvet over my head. So what we... What I think would be really useful is to recognize that people are busy, that they will continue to be busy, but then how do they respond to the busyness in a way that doesn't lead them to go, ah! So, brother, do you want to start with a sort of just a, a sensing of why 
the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh and Buddhist philosophy in general, how can that help in these times? Feeling overwhelmed can also mean suffering because uh, we feel we are not capable of handling the present moment or handling the project or the situation. And that leads to a suffering and that is why we become overwhelmed. And very interestingly, I have been overwhelmed many times. <laughs> and you may think like you share like monastics, we, we don't... Um, we're levitating, we're peaceful, we're in the clouds, we're, we're sunshine and, 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 what, and whatnot. But the reality is we are as human as you, Joe. Um, and the first, the first thing we have to do is just to be mindful and to smile to the feeling of being overwhelmed. Like really recognizing and embracing, I am being overwhelmed. And then... We have to identify why are we being overwhelmed? What is the cause of it? So normally, I think a lot of us, when we are overwhelmed, we find an escape. We try to do something to ease or to have an instant um, different sensation and feeling. And this is a core habit in all of us, the habit of running away. We want to run away from our suffering, from the present moment. So in our practice, in the teachings of the Buddha, in the teachings of Tai, we speak about the first training, which is mindfulness. And mindfulness means to be aware of what is happening in the here and now. And when we associate to this practice, a lot of the habit that we have as a practitioner, especially practitioners, is we want to feel the good sensation more than the negative. But here in the spirit of Buddhism, the teachings of the Buddha, when we, when we speak about mindfulness, it is to embrace everything that is happening. So when I am overwhelmed, I breathe in as it is a bridge for me to focus on something rather than my nonstop mind that is creating 20,000 different stories, um, blaming, judging, reacting. And if I don't do anything to it, it will ruin me. It will destroy my, my day. It will um, create more and more perceptions. And so in this very moment, the first practice, the first key is just to Breathing in, I know I am overwhelmed. Breathing out, I embrace the feeling of being overwhelmed. So with this practice of mindful breathing, and when I recognize that I am overwhelmed, I can smile to the feeling of being overwhelmed and not seeing it as something negative and it's so easy to beat myself up and to say, oh my God, I've been a practitioner for so long or I'm an adult, I should have my two feet um, on the ground, I should be solid, I'm a leader, I'm a parent, I'm a teacher. And then we create this cycle of blaming, judging. And so we're adding more layers to already the overwhelming sensation of chaos in us. So here, we're, what we're learning to do is stopping and this is the first wing of meditation and here we have to offer ourselves a very concrete practice to stop we can't like we can't just say don't do anything because even if you say that you're still doing something with your with all of your emotions so here it is we're learning to smile to the sensation of being overwhelmed embracing it using the breath and then unpacking it. So what I like to always do is I always want to come back to my body because my body is also an indicator of how I am doing. When the sensation manifests, there are tension that, that happens in my shoulders, in my face, maybe in my fist, maybe my jawline is, is really tense, or even my gaze is very intense. So coming back to the body and 
going through the different uh, parts in your body and just seeing where is the tension. Um, sometimes it's my breath when I'm overwhelmed. My breathing is very heavy. My chest may be very tight. And so I can listen to my body and say, oh, f a p who? Your breathing is really, really tight. Why is that? What is the feeling that you are experiencing? And then just to gently recognize, call it by its name, identify it, and then start to be with it. And as you are with it, start to unpack it, knowing why am I being overwhelmed? What are the causes of being overwhelmed? And once we can recognize the root of it, we start to feel already free, because suddenly you see, ah, this is why, this is what I need to work on. And then, if I have the energy and the capacity, I'm going to put all of my attention to that one cause of of being overwhelmed, and I can work with it. If I'm very overwhelmed and I already recognize that, oh, this is my cause, but I need space right now. I need to take care of myself. I I know that it is there. It's not going to go anywhere. But let me take care of my well being first. And this is very key. So we have to know our capacity. What is our limit? What is um, our energy level right now? Do I have the capacity to really dive into? The causes of my chaos right now, or do I need to take care of my well-being? And this is where the element of joy that I spoke about, even in a retreat when we are hosting 730 people, and there are so many things to micromanage in a way and to pay attention to. In the day, in the day, I always come back to my body. I'm always recognizing and identifying. Do I have enough nourishment, like real nourishment? And this is not the nourishment about skipping down the road, but this is the nourishment of like, I feel balance. I feel my mind is still. I have space. I can embrace difficulties, or also recognizing today, I'm very overwhelmed. I I shouldn't get into more conversation. Because the more I get into conversation, I am watering more dialogue inside of myself, creating more stories, more perceptions, and maybe what I actually need is just to rest. It is maybe just a simple walk in the forest, or a cup of tea with nobody, and learning to drink that cup of tea by myself, while taking care of my stillness. And so these simple things that I just mentioned to us in Plum Village, they're not just a normal action. They're not just a daily um, chore or or anything like that. It can all turn into a practice of nourishing oneself. A lot of monks um, in this time and and generations before us, um, they have Zen gardens. They have gardens that they would. Take care of because that is also a way of directing our energy. So overwhelming is an energy. So our practice is learning to identify the energy and directing the energy so that it can bring us back to balance. That's beautifully put, brother. And and, and I, you mentioned it twice, but I just want to sort of focus on one thing you said because I, I had this very. Strong visualization, as he said, because when we feel overwhelmed, it, I had this idea that it fills every every centimeter of our space, literally, and and bleeds out of that. In other words, there is no space left for us. We feel there's no space, and by naming it and by holding it, actually, what you're already saying to your mind is that you're capable of embracing it, and it has a form that you can wrap your arms around. And I think one of the things about overwhelm is people feel I can't cope. So what I hear you saying is actually by recognizing, naming it, and sort of being tender with it, we're already actually creating space that allows us because we immediately say, actually, yes, I can cope with this. Whereas normally, actually, if we if we don't 
if we don't be mindful, if we're not mindful, then actually it looks hopeless. Exactly. And, and a lot of the times, like our, our reaction becomes overreaction and we, we become the chaos that we are in. And by trying to handle it, we, we, we become more messy because our energy is so dispersed. And I've, I've, I've done this to myself. And so when we actually practice the Dharma that the Buddha has offered us and the, the teachings that Tai has offered us is learn to come back to oneself and recognize what is happening and why is it happening. And then in the knowing, Tai always say, when you are aware, you will know what to do and what not to do. And so this is insight. So by stopping, we have the capacity to have deep looking vipassana. We have the capacity to, to dive into what is manifesting in the present moment. And then because we, are, we have a practice of centering ourselves, we learn to be still, which is the image of the lake, that when the lake is calm, it will reflect everything as it is. If a bird flies by, the bird can see itself. When the cloud passes by, it reflects exactly what the cloud is. So our mind is the, is the water. And it's most of the time always um, being um, splashed and it's not very present. And so learning to slow down and to allow ourselves, giving us permission to pause. It's so simple, but it's so important because in the light of the practice, sometimes don't just do anything. Learn to sit there and to be calm and to see what is happening. And this is very fundamental. When you come to our practice in the retreats, this is the first thing we teach everyone, learning to stop. That's why these bells in the monastery is so important. We have this aspiration to stop, but our habit, our ancestral habit, our habit from society is so strong in us that we feel like we have to do something. Even if you're so agitated, you're like, okay, because I'm agitated, I need to do something. And this energy is not pleasant. And this energy actually doesn't contribute to our deepest aspiration. It may contribute to something, but it's maybe something that we need to repair later. And so what we need to learn and bring into our daily life and to the insight of recognizing when we are being overwhelmed and agitated is having that inner bell in us that chimes and say, Brother Fabu, take a pause, come back to your breathing, feel your body, recognize the emotions, the feelings that are happening in the here and now and take care of it with tenderness. Don't, don't push it away. If I don't have enough strength, I just say, I know you're there and I'm going to take care of you. But right now I need to take care of myself. So I may allow myself to go and rest total relaxation or just disconnecting myself from the space that is also contributing to the feeling of being overwhelmed. So we have to have this inner bell that, that we listen outside so that that become a habit in us, a good habit that gives us the capacity and the skill to embrace our mental formations, or we call, this is what we call it in the Buddhist terms, or all of the feelings that come up. And another way of saying it is learn to listen to yourself. What I think is very interesting, what I'm hearing from you, brother, is that don't wait for life to be difficult to start practicing, but actually 
learn to practice in the good times so that when a difficult time, we've already built that into our system. Because I think a lot of people think, oh, well, life is fine. Why do I need to be mindful? Why do I do this? Because everything's good. But actually, it's when we have space in the good times to focus and to understand how our mind works, how our body works, how we can reflect on ourselves, that in the moments where things get very tough and we lose that space, that we already know how to act. And I think a lot of people sort of feel that they can just do this when times are bad. Exactly. And the other thing, brother, I, and I want to reflect a bit on... Um, on the climate leaders retreat we had, because th there were a number of things that came up in that retreat that I think are pertinent to our conversation. And, and the first is that a lot of people feel guilt. So a lot of people actually felt guilt at coming and spending time in Plum Village. And this sort of, this sort of feeling that actually it's, it's selfish to look after ourselves. It's, f it's selfish to sort of spend time healing ourselves and that actually our work should be all, we should put all our focus on sort of trying to resolve things outside of ourselves. And, and what I think is core to the Buddhist practice is actually we can only be useful in the world if we're actually in balance ourselves. And actually it's not selfless to look after selfish to look after yourself is actually selfless because actually it's only when our bowl is full and overflowing that we're able naturally to give to other people and when our bowl is empty actually we've got nothing to give so it'd be lovely to get that sense from you about Thai's teachings on actually the importance of first of all coming home to oneself so coming home to oneself is um the beginning of transformation because when we have the capacity to come home, that's when we can work on oneself. And just just to rift off um, your sharing on the climate, it's so important to take care of the climate outside of us, but it is equally important to come back to take care of the climate inside because what we are creating in this practice it's not just a one action time. It's not just a one time journey. You, you don't just do this when you're overwhelmed, but we're trying to create a practice that keeps us well for, our, for the whole journey. We want to create sustainability outside, but we have to create sustainability inside also. And what we've learned in our own practice is that the inner peace the inner balance, you cannot buy that. The exterior things that we have, they're only conditions that can support us. But if we use it unmindfully, they also become poison. And so our culture where we have rely on so much external things and it has become the feeling of worth, the feeling of existence, because I have this, I'm worth something, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but here coming home to oneself, we actually start to reconnect to our own purpose, our own love, our own compassion. And when coming home to oneself, we actually might see that our tank of compassion is very low. Our capacity of presence is not there anymore because we have been so occupied with what we are creating outside, even if it is to protect the earth, to protect our loved ones, to protect our environment. But if we continue this, this process of how we are behaving, we will lose ourselves. We will burn out. And we have seen it in, in our own communities. We have seen it in um, our friends, our colleagues. And we've seen it in the Sangha, in our, our own Plum Village community. And learning to come home to oneself is beautiful, but it's also sometimes so challenging. Because when you come home to yourself, you start to see the ugliness inside. You start to see the habits 
that is still so alive in you that you want to transform, um, that you have set your journey to to change, but it is still there. And so, when you come home to yourself, this is transformation at the base. All the transformation that we can do in our bodily action, I can close the door more gently. I can um, walk more slowly. But if inside, I'm not taking care of my anger, my frustration, um, easing and taking care of my energies, recognizing the different energies in me, then at one point I'm just going to break. And all of these um, emotions will, will just take over me. And this is why when we come home to our, ourself, it's also learning to be truthful to ourself. We learn to be transparent with our own self. And even though we see the world is burning and I feel, who am I to have the privilege of sitting in a space that is so calm? But if you are also who have this deep aspiration, but inside of you is not burning the fire of aspiration, but it is burning with the fire of frustration and anger, resentment, then that will express itself in your speech, in your bodily action, and that will break a lot of relationship and that will break the communication, that will break the team that you are with. It will break the most precious relationship that you are with, with whom you have with, because we're not in, we are not who we want to be. And a lot of the times our habits it's the horse that is driving us forward without knowing where we are going. And so what we saw in the retreat, Joe, was that everyone express what they will take away f- from their retreat is the deep listening. And the deep listening first to themselves, listening to when they need support, when they need a moment to pause to embrace all of their feelings, all of their emotions and take a pause and to look at their aspiration, to see the aspiration that I set out. Do I still have the energy? Do I have the the right support? Do I need to find the friends that can support me? So in the coming home is also learning to stop. And and brother, as you speak, what comes to my mind is the, the... not that they're necessarily solutions, but but what helps us to address these things is it, the, the answers are not sophisticated. Mm. They're in fact incredibly simple, and um, and what was uh, one of the things that when people made commitments at the end of the retreat, a lot of people actually didn't just make commitments about work. They made commitments at, about their home life. They said, "Oh, actually, I've noted I, now. I, I now realize that when I'm speaking to my kids, I'm not." really present for them I'm also thinking of what I need to do I'm not there for my husband or my partner I'm I'm when I'm cooking I'm watching Netflix and and so there was this this sense that actually very few people were actually just present to what was going on at that moment that their mind was racing in a thousand directions and two other things that that came up very strongly for me one was that um it was a five-day retreat, and after lunch every day, we did a total relaxation where everyone came into the meditor- meditation hall and just lay down, and then there was a, a body scanning exercise and some music playing. And people, it was such a revelation to people just to take 45 minutes just to stop and just to come back, as you say, to the body, just to let everything else go. And how people, it was almost like a revolutionary act. And then... You know, when we started, we asked people, what, what keeps you grounded? What brings you joy? And it was not when I go, I like to go on holiday or go out for a fancy dinner or um, to buy a new car or anything. I, it was people largely said, I like to connect with nature. I like to go for a walk. I like to just sit somewhere quietly. And so what's so interesting is 
in a sense, our society is so sophisticated. So often we're looking for sophisticated answers, but actually the answers are actually about being calm, being quiet, being present, being singular rather than trying, trying to multitask. And, uh, and the truth is all of us can do those things. I mean, none, none of those are, we have to train for 10 years. It's not like you have to say, well, you have to um, do this for 20 years and then maybe you'll get an insight. Actually, you can do that straight away. And another thing that was um, a treat, but at the beginning, many people were scared of was the noble silence. The noble silence practice in our retreats when it starts um, at 9.30 and it leads all the way to after walking meditation in that retreat. And that's a long time of silence. And what we learned was um, friends sharing with us that at the beginning, they were quite nervous about it because we have created this culture that silence is not good, that it should always be noisy. We should have music playing in the background or um, we turn the TV on um, so that there is, we call it white noise, I believe. And so we have created this culture that there needs to be things on all the time. And what our friends shared with us was that the silence was delicious. The silence was actually one of the treat that allows us to be with ourself. And one friend shared that he got nervous when the silence was ending because suddenly the habit says, oh my gosh, I have to talk to someone now, right? But then actually you don't. You don't have to talk to anyone. If you want to continue the silence, it is there. That silence is actually always present. But we have created this lifestyle that we become afraid of the silence. And for me, I love the mornings. That's why we do our meditations early in the morning because there is um, there's something very sacred about the morning is when the day is just beginning. Our energy is, for, for myself, my own experience, I am awake my my energy is starting up and my mind is actually very calm in the morning. That's why a lot of the, the monasteries, they always start the meditations in the morning. And it's also the energy of the universe of where we are when the sun is rising. It's like we're waking up. We're waking up with the earth. So we're waking up inside of us. And so this these mornings um, is always silent and uh, in our daily um, schedule, it ends after breakfast, which is around uh, eight o'clock, right? So for me, like the silence is one of the most precious gifts I always offer myself. And then when I, when I find myself during the lazy days um, where we don't have the morning meditation, being a monk after 20 years, um, I don't really need an alarm clock. I, I, I automatically wake up around five o'clock and sometimes even earlier and sometimes a little bit later, but I always allow myself to enjoy the morning and becoming one, becoming one with the silence. I think this has been very deep for me. And I think this capacity to be at ease with it is also learning to be with oneself where we will find the inner peace because in the silence is where our nature starts to express itself, our true nature, our aspiration, our fears, our habits, our despair, because it becomes, it becomes present. And we do have to have a practice to also deal and to handle all of these emotions. And that's why um, at the beginning, when I share about the four elements, and this is our training, Joe, um, Tai has offered this to the monastics. He said, every day in our life, we have to have four elements. That is the practice. The practice is always there. And then the study. Study here is not just textbook. Study, we have to study life. We study our experience. We learn from our interaction. And if we 
if we interact with the practice, we will learn twice. And then the third is the service. We want to feel like we are contributing, contributing to ourselves, our inner growth, contributing to our community, our loved ones, contributing to society, and. When I say contribution, we may think a project. We have to create um, something very grand, but actually, we're always contributing. Our actions, our contribution. A smile is a contribution. Someone who knows how to be with himself and is peaceful, is solid, is a contribution. And then the last one is the joy. We have to have joy in meditation. If we don't taste the joy of meditation, that means we are practicing wrong. And the joy here, it it is the joy with many layers. Sometimes I I am just on Thai's deck, and I just recognize the simplicity of life, and I feel so joyful, and I feel so grateful. And these are the elements of nourishment for oneself that we can find is always there. But are you mindful? Are you present for it? And that is why, in our practice of mindfulness, we also have to learn to have the ability to be present. Presence, when when we are mindful, there is a power of presence. Such as when we are speaking now, we are so present. I feel like I am speaking to you. I'm not speaking to nobody, and this presence now it's so needed in our times. I, the loneliness comes because we lack presence. The fear is also because we feel that nobody sees us, but do we see ourselves? And that is why coming home to oneself. Is so crucial, and brother, um, you, you talked about earlier just about um, we need to fill every space, and um, I had the most profound example of that. I, I was doing a training workshops for the senior execs of a large company, and one of the executives shared. He said, "From the moment I wake up till the moment I go to sleep, I fill every single second of that time with doing something." And he'd had this realization, and he said, and at the end of it, he made a commitment. He said, "I'm going to spend 15 minutes a day just staring at a wall," which is maybe not the most effective way of doing it, but it, but it was just extraordinary. I'd, I'd never met someone who actually wasn't even allowing a moment of quiet. And when you're doing that, in a sense, you can't help by running away from yourself because you're not there. You can't touch yourself, and and my experience has also been it's a sort of general principle I have in life, which means that obviously sometimes it's wrong, but most of the time we are trying to resolve what's in ourselves in the work we do in the world because there's no it's no coincidence that we end up doing work the work we do outside because it's by its nature a reflection of what we feel inside, and and people have this misconception that a misunderstanding. And it's not conscious, but they they almost export the thing they're trying to solve in themselves to the outside world. They paint it on the outside world, then try and solve it out there. But actually, solving anything out there can never be the same as solving it inside, because when you solve it outside, often we don't get the benefit of that. Because the reason we have the problem is through issues like guilt or whatever. But when we solve it, or or we find the capacity to uh, be at peace with it inside, then we're naturally, as you say, it flows out into the world. So this idea, brother, that you know, when there's this such a again a misunderstanding that if we focus on ourselves, it's selfish, that it's egotistical, that it's actually at the expense of others. But actually, when we solve it in ourselves, we solve it for everyone around us because everyone who comes into contact with us will feel that. Mm. Mm, yes, and um, we um, we had an experience where presence was so needed for reconciliation, and we had a five hour um, team building after one of the retreats, and 
Because we were so present, we can be real with each other. If we weren't present, I don't think we would have been able to untangle all of the knots that has been accumulated. Because then we're just gonna spiritually bypass it. We're just gonna say, "All right, that was not the best, but whatever. Let's just move on to the next." Right? And that's when we don't want to be present, and we don't want to be one with another. And what I what I see in this practice of Learning to to be present is also learning to take care of the chaos, to take care of the feelings of being overwhelmed. Because to to change the energy of being overwhelmed is bringing that overwhelm energy back inwards, seeing it and working with it. And because all of us who were in the, um, that um, deep listening and loving speech session of communication, we have been practicing for a long time and we have developed our presence. And when, what I saw was when, when we all recognize, because we have the, the, the awareness of presence, when we felt that we were also overwhelmed, we allow each other to take a 15 minute break, to go for a walk. And we all went and did our own walking meditation. And that was so beautiful because that wasn't an act of running away, but that was an act of recognizing all of us are very emotional right now. And our presence, the level of presence is slowly um, disintegrating. And we were not, not, having the capacity to listen anymore. And when we recognized that, we all looked at each other and said, let's take a break. And I, I felt, for me, in, in that moment, I felt great love for the whole group and great respect because we, none of us saw that we're running away. And we all recognized that, let's go and take care of ourselves. Let's go take care of our well-being. And then we all came back and continued for another two hours, which was amazing. It was mind blowing. And the, the tears that were coming, um, the hugs, the, the smile that manifested later. And none of this could have happened. None of this transformation could have happened if none of us were able to be present for each other. And it was real work that we had to do for all of us. And there was really this kind of overwhelmed, feeling overwhelmed. And, but we looked at the sensation of being overwhelmed and we said, we have to come together and we have to be there for each other and listen to each other. And so the action, the first action we did recognize, then the second action came together to be with each other listen to each other. And then when the feeling that it was um, too much, know to take a break, come back to the practice because that practice is always there. It doesn't belong in the meditation hall. It doesn't belong in um, the monastery. It can be at any, at any space. And we all went for a walk. We all came back, looked at each other, gave each other a nod and we continued. And this is a direct experience of what we just went through of how to take care of um, the feeling of being overwhelmed because we were overwhelmed with, with um, um, the experience and, and, and there was some knot that was, that was um, manifested, some misunderstanding and we really needed to come together and to untie that. And I believe if we didn't, that knot would have carried through and we, we would have been very heavy in, in, in the wake up retreat and then to now the summer retreat. So learning to stop. Yeah. And, and in, in that stopping, because in a sense, stopping is saying, I'm no longer prepared to, I'm no longer going to run away. And when you stop and listen to yourself and are with people you trust, then it allows you to be vulnerable. So I, I feel there's such an important 
aspect of dealing with overwhelm is to be vulnerable with it. Mm. Because often we feel that to cope, we have to close down and we have to protect ourselves. Whereas actually more than often the truth is actually we open up, we share, we be present, we show our weaknesses, we show our scars. And that gives other people permission to do the same. And and one thing we haven't really described, brothers, that, you know, the, the Climate Leaders Retreat, what we were basing it around was trying to get everyone around one topic with every different perspective. So people who fundamentally agreed with the, um, this solution to the climate um, crisis and other people who f- felt it was completely wrong and there was, there was a, another solution. And what we did is we, you know, whenever I've been to climate conferences in the past, you get the full schedule in advance, you get the list of everyone who's going to be attending, and you get the pre-networking opportunities and the app so you can get in touch with people already and make your appointments. And, and so you're already judging who do I, what session do I want to go to? Who do I want to speak to? Who might help me with my project? Who do I want to avoid? Who's there who I hate? Who's there who I like? Who's there who I want to go to dinner with? Who's there, et cetera, et cetera. And what we did, we, we didn't send out any information to people. We didn't send out the schedule. We didn't send out who was going to be coming. We didn't offer any opportunities before to be in touch with each other. So people came as themselves. And, and I think that's what was most powerful about the workshop is for the first three days, there was no discussion on the actual topic at hand itself. It was just people being together, getting to know each other, getting to appreciate each other, getting to listen to each other, getting to see when they're misunderstood, when they feel appreciated. And all that actually created the opportunity to be vulnerable and the vulnerability created community and the community community created this sense of we're here to support each other we're here to help each other and so often when you feel overwhelmed you feel alone and you feel protected and you want to hide away and you don't feel any you feel the world is your enemy so i think so much of um dealing with overwhelm dealing with busyness is to be vulnerable in it mm. Because if we all feel alone and none of us are sharing about it, then actually all we're doing is exacerbating it. We, we're not letting anyone offer their support. No, no one can offer their care because actually we've closed the door. Mm, mm. Beautiful. I I totally agree. Learning to be vulnerable. I think this year, 2022, I have unlocked that. I have unlocked that in myself. <laughs> I have learned to... To cry um, and to express and to accept the tears, and and we had um, two sessions uh, that that we were able to be vulnerable with one another, and yeah, it's not weak. It's not weakness. Vulnerability is a real strength. It's a real way in. It's a real way in because we allow ourselves to crack open, mm. and and when we crack open and show ourselves more fully. And then realize actually we can do that. And that is not, as you say, it's not a weakness. Actually, it's an allowance. Mm-hmm. And it gives permission to other people to open up. And, mm-hmm. and so much of the problems in the world is everyone's trying to strive to be the perfect person. Trying to strive not to show their weaknesses, to show that you're strong and that you know what you're talking about. And actually that is driving us to the crisis we're in. And it's actually meaning that people... We're, we're actually creating the damage to the world because we're actually creating damage to ourselves. And so I think what we're creating outside is also what's creating, what's reflecting inside. Brother, one of, one of the Buddhist practices, or I'm not sure if it's a sutra, is about um, coming back to the island of yourself. Mm. Can you tell us a bit about how that is would be supportive of sort of this practice of dealing with overwhelm? Yes. 
the Buddha um, has taught many times that we all have an island in us, this island of our five skandhas, of o u r s e l f um, the island where we can come back and take refuge in o u r s e l f Because we have in the practice when we we speak about coming home to oneself, is also learning to build that refuge in ourselves. Some of us at the beginning, when we start the journey of um, spirituality, we need a teacher. We need a teacher to guide us, to show us the way, to give us the practice that we can develop. But we have to. Develop that teacher also inside of ourselves, so that we can always take refuge within ourselves. So the sutra that you just mentioned was a time when, um, in the Buddha's time, when two of the Buddha's um, um, greatest disciples just passed away, Shariputra and Mahamogiriana, and um, it was. Um, A day when the Buddha called all of his monks and nuns together, and uh, he looked at the community and he said, "You know, with the passing of um, Shariputra and Mahamogiriana, it feels like there is a a big gap in the community." And this is when when I read the sutra, it showed the Buddha's vulnerability because even the Buddha who is Enlightened and awakened being, and where everybody respects, but even he feels that there is an emptiness when two of my eldest students have passed away, and he addresses his community because I'm sure he knows that there's grief in the sangha, and so he said, um, when these two um, monastic pass away. It feels like there is an emptiness because they were such um, solid presence in the community. But you know, one day, even I will have to go. Your teacher, the Buddha, will also have to go. But I said, but isn't that how life is? In the big tree, all of the bigger branch that were there first, one day it will um, rot and collapse first, and then. But the younger Sprouts will still be there, and so this is why everyone, all of you monks and nuns, you have to learn to take refuge in yourself, in your island of practice. And for us, concretely, what is that? That is the practice of mindful breathing in the Plum Village tradition, our walking meditation practice, our practice of. Coming home to the present moment, embracing the emotions and the mental formations and the feelings that manifest. Smile to your anger. Smile to to whatever manifests in you, and embrace it and take care of it. So this island within, nobody can take that away. Nobody can take that away. The only person that will not come to that island is yourself. But we have to develop that island. We have to develop that refuge, and that is why in the first evening of our our retreat, we ask everyone to share what is a practice that we do outside. Um, of the monastery that helps ground us, you know, and everybody had a different answer. And when it came to the monastics, and, and we can only pick one, right? We said we, because we were a big group, so everyone was only allowed to pick one. And a, and I would say seventy percent of the monastics um, shared like we know it's very cliche, but my mindful breathing, that is the one place of refuge I know that will always be there for me. And this, because it is so, it is so um, installed in our tradition. The sixteen awareness of mindful breathing has become my deepest refuge, and this has become my island. So, in any situation that I am in, whatever meeting it is, when I'm listening to something that is being shared, that it is painful. It 
is hurting me. It is hurting my brothers and my sister. I've learned to not overreact or else, and I learned not to interrupt because then it becomes a fight. So the best place for me to take care of all of my emotions at that moment is to come back to my mindful breathing and to recognize my sensations. And that mindful breathing becomes the gentle palm of a loved one that is soothing, um, stroking um, the back of that little baby, that little child. And so this, when we say about the island, for us, it means our practice that we take refuge in. And all of us, we have this island that nobody can take away from us. For us monastic, our island is also our precept body. The trainings that we have received um, from the Buddha's time, um, which has been renewed by Thai and has been handed down to us. So they are a set of, of guidelines of what to do and what not to do. That is also our island, our island of freedom. We know if we are going to do this, it's going to equal suffering. So we take refuge in that island in, in ourself. And so this island within, it can always grow. And it can, it's very organic. It's very conditional, but the condition is you. <laughs> and that's the hardest part because we, we like to ask um, others to do things for us. But when it comes to the island within, it is our own investment. And the spiritual practice of mindful breathing, sitting in stillness, mindful walking, total relaxation, having a cup of tea, enjoying the sunrise, enjoying the sunset. Don't, don't think that uh, you are selfish when you're allowing yourself these quality moments. They are investment for your refuge so that you can come back to because when you have tasted it, you have faith in yourself. You have faith that you have the capacity to be still, to touch inner peace, to have understanding, to have compassion. And because you have experienced it, you know you can do it. So brother, can you give us an example of Thich Nhat Because there were periods in his life where he faced enormous difficulties and overwhelm, um, both during the Vietnam War, but also when there were difficulties for his newly ordained monastics in Vietnam. You know, there, there are many moments during his life where he's faced really, really tough places that would have overwhelmed many, many people. Have, have you got any examples of when you've seen Tai face up and how he dealt with it? Yes, walking meditation. Um, we, we would go for walks and because uh, we are a culture of awareness, so I was very in tune to, um, to Thai and I was very aware that because I'm suffering, because my brothers and my sisters in Vietnam were suffering. So as a teacher, the suffering is probably times 20 because as a teacher, you feel responsible. And the walking meditation became his island where he can come back to himself, take care of the emotions and the feelings that are arising. And I can't name them because I don't know what they were, <laughs> but I was walking behind Thai and we were um, going down um, the path to Shanghai Monastery. And so, uh, the, the path that Thai have named the legendary path. And um, it's, it's very beautiful because it's through the pine trees. And when I was walking behind him, without Tai even telling me, I, I know that the footsteps are his teachers right now. They are the place of grounding, the place of refuge. And through the practice of of channeling our energy, then clarity manifests. And during this time, Tai used the suffering and he wrote these amazing letters to his students. And in the past, like Tai would write 
us letters every year. It's very personal. He would write by hand, and then we we would all receive a photocopy of it. And it it was like it was like the best check of the year that we would receive. And normally, Tai would give us a letter um, twice a year, like one time in the spring, and then one time in the summer during the summer retreat because it's our most busiest um, season, and we're all. Offering probably 120% of ourselves to the whole community. We're, we're um, hosting the retreat, we're cooking, we're um, um, giving Dharma talks, giving presentations, consultations, and, and nonstop. And so, Tai, as a teacher, he, he's so aware that his students are going above and beyond. And, you know, and, and the whole community uh, who is present is giving 100% to everyone. And so he would write um, by week three. Uh, he's he, he's he's very he has the understanding of the mind, so he knows when to give the the vitamin C in a way. And Tai would write these um, these encouraging words, and it's so beautiful. And and like one example, he would say, you know, by the way of our presence when we are offering a smile to someone. Many um, work for years to see the effect of their impact, but with your mindful smile and compassionate smile, you can offer the other person a smile and they can bloom a smile on their face. Your impact is right here, right now. And it's because we were very young and Tai was helping us see that not by waiting to become enlightened, to have an impact to the world, not to wait until... We're 50 years as a monastic to have an impact. But I said, here and now, there is impact. But during this era of, especially when Tai has suffering, this is when he writes the deepest poetry. If you read Tai's poem from Please Call Me By My True Name, some of the deepest insight comes from the suffering. And so Tai would use the suffering to have deep insight to look at the suffering. And so during the time of um, the war, you know, one of the poems that, and one of the lines that still stays with me and is one of my Northern star that helps me not lose myself when I'm super angry um, is man is not our enemy. It is ignorance, right? Sometimes because you see that it is ignorance and but the other person still has that perception or that view, you get so aggressive, you get so angry, and that anger becomes poison towards yourself. So Tai wrote this poem, Recommendation, for us who wants to read it. And um, Tai says that, man is not our enemy, it is ignorance. And when you see that it is ignorance, you want to help them be free from that ignorance rather than you want to kill them or destroy them. So in the Prajna time, um, Tai would write these letters to us and he would share that this is a wake-up bell for Vietnam or this is a chance for us to see that there is still so much suffering in the world and that is why we have to be the compassion the understanding, even though they don't have understanding, we have to have understanding. And we don't become a victim to to the suffering, but we can see that they are a victim to a view. And so Tai would use the practice to have the clarity to look at the situation in a new light. So that was um, something that I... I I was able to witness and and even be a part of. And another practice that Tai always comes back to is calligraphy. Tai would really enjoy doing calligraphy, you know, the the whole process, making a cup of tea, pouring, um, drinking the cup of tea, and then pouring a little bit of um, the tea in the ink, and then cutting the paper, the rice paper, setting up the table, and then one at a time, just do calligraphy, phrase, um, sentence after sentence. And each sentence is a practice. So, so you're generating activities to help focus 
your your own energies and so this is something that we all can pick up on and but it, you see that every every example i gave you was not something to run away from it wasn't a screen to forget yourself into a, a netflix series or it wasn't music to lose your, yourself in but it's always something to bring yourself back to the present moment to give you more clarity and then have insight and then writing it down as an art as also a discovery and and a truth in a way So, brother, what I hear, you know, when I, I'm just taking in sense, it all in, in. My, no, in my <laughs> mind, sort of linking that then back to busyness and overwhelm, because it, because what it brings up for me is that, well, a few things. Firstly, if we have compassion for ourselves in our overwhelm, then we'll have compassion for everyone else in their overwhelm. So, so that's just a natural connection to people. But also, if we're able to um, slow down for ourselves then actually we slow down things for other people. And and it was that sense of, you know, that, you know, there's so many issues in the world that have been created from our busyness and from our striving and from our determination to stand out and be individual. And so when we're able to solve that in ourselves, we solve it in the world. Whereas if we come to try and solve these problems of the world, by being guilty, by being overwhelmed, by being busy, by thinking it's all our responsibility, by thinking it's all on our shoulders, then actually we're trying to solve the problems of the world with the problem that created the world. So actually the only way that actually you can solve these problems outside is if we find a new way inside. And the new way inside is, of course, nothing is ever new. It's actually coming back to the wisdom of... of um, indigenous and and people from the past who recognize that actually slowing down resting healing and from that place we feel fresh we can feel joy we can be patient we have insights we have clarity and those are the gifts that we need to bring to the world not more busyness not more overwhelm not more guilt because the world is already full of those and just lastly brother i think one other thing when it comes to overwhelm which maybe worth touching on is it is of course the core buddhist notion of impermanence because i know for myself that when there are moments where i feel overwhelmed in that moment i feel it's going to last forever because if if you know when it fills up so much and you just look at it and you just say wow i can't cope and that almost becomes this idea that that is it this is the way it's going to be um Yet we know that actually life is, con- well, we know on one level, we know that life constantly is changing, that that overwhelm at one point will not be necessarily overwhelmed, even two or three hours later or a day later. But actually, it, it feels really helpful to recognize that actually what we feel overwhelmed by will change. Our feelings of overwhelm will change and we ourselves will change. But it might be helpful, brother, just to just to link that sense of impermanence to busyness, overwhelm, feeling, oh my God, I can't cope. Yeah. Yes, everything is of the nature of impermanence. Our emotions are impermanent. The feelings, they come and they go. Sometimes some feelings stay much longer, but it is also the nature of impermanence. There's a cycle to it. And... um, our teacher has advised us on multiple times when you, the strong emotion comes, it is like the big storm. Learn to close your senses, the doors, so that the wind don't come in and blow everything. Learn to close um, the mind, um, sense of what you're hearing, what you're listening to, what is agitating you. Come back and be with the storm inside. And you know that when you're with the storm, the storm will ease. And you can even watch the storm 
you can see the hurricane, but you are safe in this refuge. And Tai has taught. Um, and I was a teenager when I first came uh, in my early years of, of Plum Village before I decided to become a monk. And this teaching Tai would give to the young ones, he always encouraged us to develop deep belly breathing as an anchor. And especially when we have very strong emotion, don't become a victim of your emotions. Because the emotions is just a part of you. It is not everything of you. And the emotion, it will arise and it will also go away. And it, when you have these super intense emotions and feeling, come back to your deep belly breathing and breathe with it. Let the emotion be guided by your breathing. And Tai has told us um, to put our hands on our abdomen and to invite our breath to become deeper and slower as we breathe out. And so this, um, this practice of deep breathing has been a deep friend of mine <laughs> that I always come back to when the strong emotions manifest that becomes my greatest refuge because it allows me to see the storm and not to be um, a victim of the storm. And having the insight of impermanence, knowing that everything will end, but I have to also help create the condition for it to end. But I need clarity to see how, how am I continuing to nourish the storm or Am I offering more elements to the storm? And so this deep breathing has, um, has been such a support for me. But like you said, don't wait until you're overwhelmed and into your strong emotion to practice because that is when it's too late. You have to do it now when you, we are well enough, we are clear enough, we have um, energy and we develop, we invest in our, our true nature, our, our refuge, our own refuge, so that when the time comes and we need that refuge, we can rely on it. And to go even further, even when you're joyful, you can be in the refuge because that joy, the happiness, the love that you are experienced can also nourish that refuge. So the refuge also needs nourishment. So don't also just see it as a life jacket, but see it as a companion for you, um, for, for it to, to be with you in this whole journey. Yeah, and, ju and just finally, brother, uh, one last thing that comes to my mind is we never do things alone. You know, the power of community, you know, it's, uh, and again, just referencing the climate leaders retreat, that people came as individuals and they left as a community, even when people disagreed with each other about the route forward. And I think overwhelm often comes from feeling we have to do it on our own. And, uh, and I think, you know, what I see constantly here in Plum Village is that this is a community and this is the age of community. Mm. This is the age where we come, have to come back to community because when we see ourselves as individuals um, and, and not part of community, then, then we, it's much easier to get overwhelmed. It's much easier to feel you can't cope. But when you have a community of practice and a community of people, then actually we all end up supporting each other and that just changes the whole nature. So, um, dear listeners, um, I hope uh, you've enjoyed this episode. Um, and uh, brother, we um, normally end with a quiet, not a quiet reflection, but a, um, a moment of reflection. Um, and so I wonder if you could maybe give us a short meditation. Dear friends, wherever you may be, if you are going for a jog, if you're walking, if you're sitting on a bus, sitting in a car, or cleaning your house, just offer yourself this space to be still 
You can remain standing or you would like to find a bench, a sofa, a chair, and just be seated or even lay down, allowing yourself to fully feel the weight of your body relaxing on this planet, on Mother Earth. So give yourself that space to just be still. Feel your two feet on the ground. And now I invite you to become aware of your in-breath. As you breathe in, just say, this is my in-breath. As you breathe out, just say, this is my out-breath. In and out. And as I breathe in, I allow my breath to become deeper, feeling my abdomen rising. As I breathe out, I allow my breath to become slower as my abdomen is falling. Deep in breath. Slow out breath. And as I breathe in, I recognize calm in me. As I breathe out, I breathe out with ease. In, calm, out, ease. Breathing in, I want to offer a smile to myself. Breathing out, I release all in my mind, all my worries, the tension. For this moment, I'm just going to release. I smile to myself, breathing in. And I release, I release my burdens. Offer that smile of love and tenderness to yourself. Release your fear in this moment. Knowing that you are a source of love and compassion. Breathing in, this is a present moment that I allow myself to dwell in. Breathing out, this is a wonderful moment. Being alive, being here, because you are alive, everything is possible. In, present moment, out, wonderful moment. And in this moment, I invite you to reflect a gratitude that you have for yourself. Thank you to myself. And bring that gratitude to the mind's eye. And smile to that gratitude to yourself. And 
breathing in, I am grateful to myself. Breathing out, I am grateful to all the conditions around me that supports me, that guides me, that offer me love and compassion. Thank you, friends, for joining, listening, and practicing with us. So, dear listeners, we want to, first of all, also thank Robbie, who's a long-term lay friend who has stepped in today to do the recording with us. So, Robbie, thank you for joining us. Um, If you've enjoyed this episode, uh, there are lots more. So, uh, you can find the series The Way Out Is In on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on other platforms that carry podcasts and on our own, very own Plum Village app. And this podcast was brought to you by the generous donors of the Thich Nhat Hanh Foundation. If you would like to support future episodes of the podcast and the work of the international Plum Village community, please visit www.tnhf.org slash donate. Thank you very much and see you again next time. The way out is in. Oh.